Welcome back to the last day of camp. Today, we're going to learn a bit about some of the other stages of making a game and to go over what we learned making games this week. And we'll have a little bit of question asking period after I'm done. So this week, we're as a little bit like a game jam, which is where people get together to make a short game in a matter of days. It's usually used for prototyping games or to learn new skills and meet new friends. So there's a lot more you, you should know about making games other than just coding, art, and music. So I'm going to go over some of it today. So first, we're going to talk about crunch because it's so important. So crunch is when you stop working full-time hours and you start doing a ton of overtime work. Instead of doing eight hours a day at your job, you might suddenly be asked to stay as long as possible. Crunch is something that happens a lot in the game industry, and it's usually due to poor planning or overpromising. It also happens when projects have a strict release date, and for whatever reason, you don't have enough time to finish a game. When crunch happens, everyone working on the project is expected to work long overtime hours. The film and game industry are pretty similar, and I've been on a film project where some people were working up to 16 hours a day for three months without a weekend off. This isn't something that's an anomaly and happens accidentally. A lot of times companies expect developers to crunch. It's so common that almost everyone who works in this industry has experienced it at some point or another. The reason we're talking about crunch is because it's extremely unhealthy People need a healthy balance of work and play and risk experiencing burnout or breakdown if they work too much. Because of crunch being so common, a lot of people leave the game industry in their 20s and they want a more balanced workplace when they're older. It's very hard to balance your work and home life if you're working long hours. Then you try to cook, sleep, shower, and get your housework done. And then you end up with no time for friends or hobbies so a lot of people struggle with it. If you do manage to overwork yourself, it's not as easy as taking a vacation and then you'll feel better. If you push yourself too hard, it could take years to recover. So it's very important that if you do run into crunch in the future, to try your absolute hardest to keep yourself healthy. Part of the reason I had us break down our game when we first started and everything that we needed beforehand is because we need to be able to estimate how much time we have and all the pieces of the game that need to get made. A lot of the time, programmers don't understand how long art takes to make, and a lot of artists don't understand how long code can take to do. The same goes for project managers and anyone who works on a game. Basically, if you haven't done it, you'll usually not understand how long something takes to make which is why it's important to get experience making games so that you can start to learn how much goes into making a game. And if we don't time our if we don't plan our time properly, crunch is usually the result. So how do we avoid crunch? Planning properly is the best way that we can avoid it, but sometimes it happens anyways. Sometimes companies will push the release date of a game, or they'll release patches after the release date. Some companies don't give a release date at all. They'll just say, coming soon, and they'll work on it until it's done. That way, no one has to hurt their health in order to finish a game. The time is almost up on our current projects. So if this was a professional project, this could technically be crunch time if you are falling behind because you need to meet a deadline. But I don't want you to work overtime or anything. I am more concerned that you learn how to plan your games and time properly and take good care of your health. So what we're going to do instead is I'm going to get you to look at what you have left to do and adjust your scope. A good way to help avoid crunch is to adjust your scope as you go. I want you to figure out how much code you have left to do, 
how much art, how much sound and music, and then I want you to estimate how much time it will take to finish all of those and how much time you have left. I want you to ask yourself, have you planned too little? Have you planned too much? What I usually do during a game jam, which generally is roughly three days, is figure out my priorities first and everything else is extra. So I focus on those priorities and then I slowly go down the list from most important to least important. If I'm super lucky, I'll have enough time for everything. But you really can't plan for things like bugs or tech problems. So what I like to do is actually allocate some tech support time into my plans as well. If it doesn't end up used, that's great. I have more time to work on my game. Otherwise, if problems happen, it's more likely that it won't cut into my game making time. Usually, I try to focus on code first before everything. Focus on the most important features of your game first. Anything extra that can be cut out, don't focus on until you've got the base features of your game working properly. I'd like you to keep a bug list. Look for game breaking bugs and aim on fixing those first. Bugs that don't ruin the game can be left for later. Or, in some cases, bugs can actually become features. We've had a few bugs that actually ended up making the game more fun, and we kept them as features. An example of this is that we made a game about a bear chasing hunters, and you were able to punch the other players towards the bear. The players found out that they could actually punch each other, and by doing so, they were able to rocket across the screen and get away from the bear faster, and they found that a lot of fun. This wasn't a game-breaking bug, but it was unintended, so it was a bug. However, our players loved it, so we kept it. Now, if you're running out of time, and you don't think you have enough time to finish everything, I just want you to focus on getting your game actually working. Focus on your code. Having a working game is better than having a game that is broken in parts. And if you have, you have more than enough time, that's great. Make sure everything's complete first. And then if you have extra time beyond that, you can start to try thinking of little things you can do to make your game more polished. I would focus on code first, then graphics, then sound and music, and then any little extras that you think would make your game more fun. Scope is so very important when it comes to games. So when you first start your game and you start planning it, if you plan too much and you don't have enough time to finish anything, you are out of scope for your game. You always want to remain within scope, which means taking in a base idea to start with and then building on it and making sure that you'll have enough time and manpower for everything. So when you're planning a game, you want to ask yourself how much time you have for everything and then try to estimate how long everything will take. And if you run out of time, you cut features that aren't as important. If you have more time, you get to polish your game and make it look and run better and better. You get to decide what is more, most important and what you want to focus on. So say you're more of an artist than a coder then you might want to focus mostly on the art and have limited code, for example. There is a game company that I know of that is made mostly of artists and very few coders. The games are simple to play, but they look absolutely gorgeous. So whatever you are good at, you can always gain, sk gain skills in other areas, but if you have a very specific love for a certain part of game making, try focusing on that. Most game companies prefer someone to specialize in something rather than to generalize. However, it depends on the market. If you're working in an indie game or in Winnipeg, for example, they want you to do a little bit of everything and to generalize. 
But if you were working for something like EA in Vancouver, for example, they'd want you to do one job and they want you to do it well. So something you can think about is if you want to work for a company, if you want to be an indie developer, or even just do games as a side hobby. Scope is something that professionals have trouble with all the time, which is why we have project managers or we do game jams to get a better sense of what we're capable of. But for smaller projects like this, it's important to get used to game planning so that it saves you work in the future. There is nothing more frustrating than making a large section of work and then it being removed from the game because there's not enough time to finish it or you changed your mind because your planning wasn't great and now it's obsolete, so you have to throw out a bunch of stuff. And also, if you're working with a team, it's important to constantly get communication as to what everyone is doing, what your deadlines are, and to communicate how your progress is going. A lot of problems I've seen are due to miscommunication, and it can save so much time if you get good at talking with your coworkers. So it's important to practice your game making skills and get better at predicting the scope of your projects. Doing small projects like this is a great first step. I'd, re I'd recommend continuing to make games and then slowly building up with more and more difficult games in order to get more experience. Every new jam game I do, I learn something invaluable. So normally during a game jam or even creating a commercial game, you're going to want to bug test your game and get player feedback. The reason we do this is because everyone thinks very differently to us and we might be unable to see the problems with our own game. Someone might solve puzzles completely differently or they might play in a way that you didn't expect. So it's pretty important to get people other than yourself to check out your game. If we were making these games in person, I'd be asking you all to walk around and check each other's games and to help each other figure out your code. At a game jam, everyone is friendly, they want to check out each other's games, provide feedback, and help with code. It's a great learning environment. So generally, We'd want a few things from people who play our games. We want them to play through our games, find bugs and errors we didn't notice so that we can fix them. And we also want their feedback on how they felt about the game and how difficult they found it so that we can get an idea of how our players think. So when it comes to bug testing, you want to play as many paths through the game as possible and you want to try and do things you're not sure will work. Basically, when you're bug testing, you want to try and break the game. You want to do things you wouldn't expect a player to do. You want to try as hard as you can to get the game to glitch. Sometimes games get so complicated that some bugs only happen under very specific circumstances. So the more people and platforms to test it on, the better. So we had one bug in our bear game in which it worked fine on PC, but the exact same code went wild on a Mac system. So in the PC version, our bear is supposed to chase the players and he would slowly start ramping up speed and he would get faster and faster as the game went on to make it more and more difficult. However, in our Mac version, it was the exact same code, but our bear wasn't moving. And then suddenly he'd start to vibrate wildly. And then after a few seconds, he'd immediately teleport to the players and send them flying off the screen. So whatever you make your plat whatever platform that you make your game for, make sure to test on multiple if you can. And also the more people that can play your game and test it, the better. Usually a lot of bugs are found by other people. Since we already tend to know how our game is supposed to work, we have a blind spot. Since we're in an online environment, I can't ask you to walk around and check on each other's work. But at the end of this lecture, I'll be showing you how to upload your game so that you can send the links to your friends. And then you can ask your parents, 
your siblings, or your friends to try your game and see if they can find any errors or bugs. If they can stream themselves playing the game, that's even better. I found that watching players is more helpful than hearing about it afterwards. So some bugs that you can look out for in your Pong game. Bugs might be something like sound not playing when it should be, score points not counting properly, winning stages not working, a player going out of bounds of the map, or the ball bouncing erratically. It could also be images not working properly with the game. If you've added bonus stuff to your game to try and make it more interesting, the more complicated it gets and the more unexpected bugs can appear, but it can still be fun. So after you've had a friend play through your game, you might ask them a bunch of different questions. But keep in mind, you do not want to change everything in your game just because someone says so. Everyone has different tastes, and it's possible they just won't like your game. This doesn't mean that other people won't as well. However, if you're getting the same feedback from a lot of different people, that might mean it's an actual problem that you might consider addressing. So an example for a jam game would be, we created a lot of puzzles in a game that we made, and the puzzles were so hard because there was no hints, and a lot of people struggled when they tried playing our game. We ended up adding little notes with hints around the in-game house. Our players suddenly went from unable to complete the game to most of them being able to figure out the puzzles with enough time. We wanted there to be a challenge, so we didn't make the puzzles easy enough that everyone figured them out, but the majority did, so we were happy with that. It's very easy for the player to get confused. Maybe they don't know what buttons to press, and they need a tutorial. Sometimes they don't know their current goal or objective, and they just get lost and frustrated, and they don't know where to go or what to do. I had one game when I first started making games that had hidden doors and no clues, and my bug tester had literally no idea where to go. Some game designers like to make hidden things pop out somehow, like a crack in the wall if there's a hidden door behind it. Or if they want you to walk in a specific direction, sometimes they'll have light hitting a dark area. And also, sometimes, if you've written something for a game, it will not be understood the same way you writ it, either. Ask your players if they were confused at any point in the game, and what may have made it clearer. You don't always need to change things in your game, but if no one is having fun, that's usually a good sign that you need to change something. Also, sometimes players will have ideas that they want to share, and they'll be good ones. But a lot of the time, they don't understand how a game is made, and they don't understand that it's not as easy as they thought it would be. A good example of this is players who ask for a single game to become multiplayer. Usually games are designed with this in mind, and it's very hard to add something like multiplayer afterwards. Another thing to figure out or ask is how they solve problems or puzzles. I played an escape room with a group of six once, and we came across a puzzle that we guessed but we didn't actually solve it, and we baffled the puzzle designer. It's important to learn if there's different ways to solve the puzzles that you choose, because everyone thinks differently, and everyone plays games differently. You should also keep in mind what type of player you want to play your game. If you have someone that doesn't like reading stories, their opinion won't be as important if the game is designed for. If someone reviews an RPG but he hates RPGs, his opinion is going to be negative no matter what. So if you can find people who like the type of game that you're making, the better off you'll be. So think about the type of people who might play your game, but keep in mind that you also might be pleasantly surprised, and a different group of people might end up liking your game instead. A common theme that I see is a game designed for a different age group, but other age groups will like it as well. So knowing all of this, make sure to listen to your players, but only change things in your game if there are actual problems. And the more people you can get to play your game, the more bugs you'll find, and the more polished it'll get. You cannot skip this step. 
The most bugs our games that games ends up with are the ones that don't get enough people to play it. So with that in mind, if you have any friends that you want to bug test your game, I'll teach you how to save it out and send it, and then you can have them play through it. The more people that play your game, the more you will learn. And it's okay if you can't find anyone this week, just keep it in mind for future games. There's also an unexpected form of bug testing that happens sometimes if you release a game, Let's Plays. So when we released our Jam games online, we immediately started getting Let's Players playing our games. It was really weird to see strangers playing our games at first because they were just meant for our Winnipeg Game Jam community, but it, it did end up being a good thing. Watching them was really helpful and the players usually found bugs we didn't even know existed. Because we could watch them playing, we knew the conditions that had already been met upon meeting the bugs. So it helped us recreate the same conditions that caused the bugs so we could figure out why they were happening. We even, man we even had a player manage to beat the game in a way that we didn't think was possible. We ended up releasing a couple of patches due to Let's Plays. Something I'll note though about Let's Plays, they don't usually convert into getting more people to play your game. The audience who likes to watch games isn't always the same audience of people who like to play games. So while they can be really helpful from a bug testing or feedback component, we've generally found that they don't always translate into more game downloads. This doesn't, however, mean that they're taking away your game downloads, unless your game is very linear and there's only one way to play the game. And also, sometimes people have unexpected reactions. We had a bunch of players laughing during what was supposed to be a scary moment. They had a completely different take on it. So it's really helpful to see if your intended experience is coming off differently. It helps you grow as a writer and a developer. So if you're ahead of the game and you're almost finished, here are some ideas to polish your game and make it stand out. The reason we polish games is because players definitely spot a roughly made game and there are so many games on the market we need our games to stand out. Negative reviews can kill a game before it's started, so we want to make sure our game is polished as possible before we release it. A lot of negative reviews aren't actually helpful, but some are legitimate. Maybe their game isn't starting or their save file broke. It's important to try and prevent negative reviews before they happen by polishing our games before we release them. Some ideas of things you can do to polish your game is if you have any dialogue, make sure to spell check it. I've seen so many misspelled things, even in professional projects, and it makes it look unprofessional. It's also harder for people to read and it takes the player out of the fantasy of being in the game. You can also go over any existing art, sound, or music and make it even better. A good example of this is Stardew Valley. So on the right side here, I have the art for one of the characters as she evolved over the years. So the top left is how she originally looked and eventually she went through so many iterations that she ended up looking like she does on the bottom right. The artist just kept learning how to do things better and changing things until it looked market ready. If there are any little bugs that don't really do much to break your game, you can spend the time to fix them. If there are any big, big game breaking bugs, they are not an option and they need to be fixed. And if you think the player will need one, add a tutorial. I've had so many players confused how to play the game unless they had a tutorial. It doesn't even have to walk the player through a small section of the game. Even just a screen that says what buttons do will help a lot. You could also add a menu or an end screen if you had time just to make your game look more polished. And behind the scenes, you can clean up messy code. The player might never see the end result but having clean code will be helpful if you come back to work on the game later, or if you need reference for future code. In bigger games, this is pretty important because things can get bloated quickly and hard to work with. Another thing you can do is adjust your sound levels. So if your music is too loud to hear your sounds, 
you can either adjust the level of your sounds in Audacity, or you can adjust the level of your music so you can hear everything. And finally, we can add credits to the game. When you're adding credits, keep in mind all of the crediting you were asked to do when it comes to sound or art files and anyone who helped with the game. And finally, a great way to learn from your experience making a project is to do a post-mortem. In Winnipeg, sometimes we have post-mortems after game jams so that we can teach the lessons that we've learned to other game devs. GDC's YouTube channel actually gives a lot of game postmortems of games you've probably heard of. They're a lot of fun to watch and learn from. So it's important to ask yourself questions like these because they will help you in the future. Try and figure out where you struggled so you can work on that and get better at it the next time. If you know you find something easy, you know you'll spend less time on it and be better at time management. So the first question I like to ask is, do you feel like you had enough time to finish your game? It's very easy to overscope, and I've done it tons of times, where I've run out of time and didn't have enough time to finish during game jams. The second question I'd like to ask is, how would you plan your game differently next time? So what did you not know about planning that would have been helpful? Knowing what you do now, what would you do to plan or keep track of your time? Would you stick with the same plan or would you plan more in detail or less in detail? The third question I'd like you to answer is, what were the hardest parts about making the game? Is it getting it done on time? Is it understanding the coding? Was it making your art? Where did you have troubles and what were they? And the fourth question I'm going to ask is, what was something you learned about making video games that you didn't know before? A lot of answers I usually get to this question is that my students don't realize how much work goes into making a game. What did you think about video games before that was proved wrong? What did you guess about making video games that was right? And finally, the fifth question I'm going to ask is what was your favorite part about making video games? Everyone has something that they like doing best. Was it coding? Was it art? Was it music? Was it planning? And why? The most important thing about making games is the experience and learning from it, and learning what skills that we still need to work on. So if you have the time, I'd like you to do a short postmortem for yourself and write down these questions for future reference. There's so much that can be learned from looking back at what you've done and it can also help future developers if you choose to share what you've learned in the process. And now finally, if you guys want to share your games with each other, and I do recommend this so you can get feedback, at the top of Scratch, you can name your game and you can click the share button. And then um, if you're sharing your games with your friends, I'd like you to get them to bug test your game and talk to you about it. It really helps as a developer to get other people playing your games and to learn from the experience. I'd also like to invite you to send the links to the games that you've made to us as well. I'd love to look over your games and see what you've all created. So this is our last lecture. I just wanted to thank you all for joining this class and getting started with coding and game making. I hope that you found something that you enjoyed from this class and that you managed to learn a little bit more about making games. It's been a great week with you all. If you have any more questions, I'll be around for a final question taking period. And again, please email us the link to your game if you can, because we'd love to see it. This concludes our classes. Have a great rest of the summer and keep making games.